Sustainable Tourism, Chapter 2. As we mentioned in Chapter 1, a number of issues complicate and cloud the realization of sustainability in tourism. The first is, as we've pointed out, the contradictory ideas optimistically forced together any time you add the concept of sustainability to human profit-maximizing endeavors. It's like pressing together the negative poles of two magnets and strapping them in place. Hall, 1998, tells us, Sustainable development emerged in an attempt to reconcile conflicting value positions with regard to the environment. Yet Weaver points out that Hall also describes sustainable development as an essentially contested concept, the application of which is inherently a matter of dispute, depending on the values and ideologies of various stakeholders. Hall suggests that the consensus of support that is developed around the concept might simply disguise largely opportunistic support for the more ideologically polarized platforms of the past and might continue them. As discussed in Chapter 1, the semantics are appealing to both the pro-growth and slower anti-growth supporters, with development having particular resonance with the former and sustainable being attractive to the latter. Says Romerill, 1994, sustainable tourism as a result can mean just about anything to anyone rendering it vulnerable to appropriation by either group. For supporters of the advocacy platform, it represents continual tourism growth and intensification, while for supporters of the cautionary and adaptancy platforms, it often represents alternative tourism and a halt to mass tourism development. Accordingly, the consensus surrounding the principle is liable to dissolve once a diverse group of stakeholders begins the process of implementation. Page 19. The hope is that we can flip the sign on development so that sustainability sticks. But there are some who feel that at the pace population is growing, all attempts to mitigate the negative effects of development are doomed to failure, and that most sustainable tourism is just window dressing and greenwashing that masks a slow but inevitable erosion of the environments and social conditions that subtend our capacity for long-term happiness. Weaver tells us that several authors, among them McClellan in 1997, quote, raise a more sinister implication of this excessive flexibility, alleging that some businesses and governments deliberately use sustainable and allied terms such as ecotourism to give a false impression of environmental and social responsibility to the public. In combination with a failure to address the broader problems of appropriation and implementation, the exposure of such practices could cause sustainable tourism to be perceived by the public as nothing more than a discredited, cynical, and empty cliché." Still, there is hope. Weaver points out, quote, The semantic flexibility of terms such as sustainable development and sustainable tourism make the terms vulnerable to appropriation, but also facilitates the construction of weak and strong approaches to sustainability. The malleability of the terms thus don't have to be a net liability if we adopt an adaptive paradigm, where weak sustainability is used kind of as a gateway drug to stronger and stronger approaches. Weak approaches are particularly suitable for extensively modified environments. For example, in the inner city, where nature protection is almost irrelevant, according to Weaver, because there's little nature there to begin with or massively degraded landscapes like abandoned strip mines or abandoned farmland. In the part of Germany where I've lived for the last 10 years, one of the most popular tourist destinations we visit is an abandoned coal mine named Zeche Zolferein that has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The coal processing plant itself has been turned into an art and technology museum with fancy restaurants, and the extensive grounds have been reforested and replanted with native vegetation and sport winding bicycle paths with signage talking about how nature can reclaim industrial areas once people apply the principles of sustainability. Each year that we visit the site, it becomes greener and greener as it is rewilded, going from what was once a smelly, toxic eyesore that covered the town with soot and caused black lung disease, to a vibrant parkland where wildlife and families and children mingle. I also visited a rainforest golf course in Sumatra, being designed by my Indonesian godfather, who told me, we've built the golf course on degraded farmland. No trees had to be cut to make it. In fact, we preserved all of the old growth forest pockets that were on the farm and thousands of acres of buffer, buffer forest around it. Now nobody can hunt or extract timber and we use no pesticides or herbicides on our greens. In effect, 
This golf resort has become a wildlife preserve, and the region is much better off than when it was open to farming because the high revenues ensure that the forest, which gives the resort a feeling of exclusivity, is preserved. This is called an anthropocentric rationale for protecting or even enhancing nature, and for all that the resort is doing to protect wildlife, the fear is that it may backfire if social justice issues are not resolved. So long as there is a trickle-down from the resort to the surrounding community in the form of employment or revenues, it will be supported. But if the resort does not share its benefits, the surrounding community may begin to poach the buffer zone and even at, engage in acts of sabotage. When it comes to relatively undisturbed natural and cultural settings, strong sustainable tourism strategies become even more important. Hunter, 1997, reminds us that in these areas, even a small increase in tourism-related activity could result in unacceptable environmental or socio-cultural costs. Here's one way I think about it, a thought exercise that we might all engage in. Imagine a crystal clear pool of water in a sheltered lagoon with a mixed sand mud bottom and a population of healthy fish. I lived on such a lagoon in the rainforest village of Macanche in Guatemala. People start to arrive and enter the water to swim and fish and bathe and wash their clothes. The sediments get stirred up by each person who enters and the water starts to get clouded. Fish are being removed by those fishing. Soap salts and shampoos are being added by each of the bathers. At a certain volume of visitors, natural ecosystem services can assimilate the disturbances. When the swimmers and bathers go home, the sediments that were kicked up start to settle. The soaps and shampoos begin to be broken down by the vegetation and the algae and the snails. Fish populations start to recover from the fishing. But with each added visitor and shorter and shorter periods for recovery, the carrying capacity of the lagoon is diminished. Because natural ecosystems are living systems, they're prone to uncertainties. Population explosions of organisms that are more tolerant of human activity can quickly upset the balance and lead to extinctions and collapse. In water bodies, this is referred to as eutrophication. Proponents of strong sustainable tourism, using the knowledge-based platform that we spoke of in Chapter 1, apply the precautionary principle, the idea that, quote, a course of action should be avoided if its consequences are unknown. Disney resorts laudably applied this principle recently when they learned that a proposed resort on a tropical island could cause severe damage to a unique coral reef system. Where tourism is allowed, alternative options such as small-scale tourism are preferred, but in extreme cases, like the voluntary decision by Disney not to develop, the rational approach may often be the prohibition of all tourism activity from certain areas. In effect, this is an acknowledgement that development almost always has negative consequences and that all development, to be sustainable, needs to be done in a way that allows natural ecosystem services to repair that damage. You can think of tourism like a night on the town for a natural ecosystem. It needs time to get over the hangover before it can go drinking again. This is why the crux of the argument between anthropocentric weak sustainability approaches and cautionary strong sustainable tourism strategies often revolve around the question, just how degraded is the area to begin with? Weaver points out that theme parks are a difficult call since they're more or less completely artificial environments which nonetheless were often carved out of a natural ecosystem and still have a huge impact on surrounding ecosystems. One of the burning questions that we will address in Chapter 6 when we discuss attractions is, can theme parks actually be used to enhance the environment rather than always degrading it? The Zechi Sulfurine coal mine example I gave is one indication that the answer may be yes, but ironically, enhancement may be predicated on first destroying an environment completely and from that untenable baseline working to repair the damage and bring new life to an area. The question then becomes, are the developers sophisticated enough in their understanding of ecology to recreate a functional ecosystem that will not collapse in time? Unfortunately, the Biosphere 2 experiment in Arizona, where scientists and developers tried to create a completely anthropogenic, hermetically sealed simulation of the major biomes on the Earth to see if we could create viable colonies on the Moon or Mars, failed completely. Insect populations and so-called weeds and other vegetation got out of control, food production systems fell apart, even the oxygen levels plummeted to dangerous levels. This showed that we aren't quite ready to create living systems that can perpetuate sustainably, even with intense management and sophisticated knowledge and enormous amounts of money. So the question is, status quo 
or enhancement. From page 20, Weaver points out another big problem facing sustainable tourism, and that is that even if we ignore the problematic of what development means or doesn't mean, even the term sustainable is loaded and unreliable as a predictor of positive outcomes. Weaver reminds us that, quote, the term sustainability has steady state connotations that suggest the maintenance of the existing situation. He cautions us that sometimes, quote, the term actually encourages the perpetuation of an unsustainable status quo. So you're sustaining the unsustainable, page 20. We ask ourselves, sustain what? What do we want to sustain? Do we want to sustain poverty, sustain injustice, sustain monocultures with vast stands of pines or single species grasslands? There's an undercurrent discussion among sustainable development and tourism planners to dispense with the term sustainable altogether. For example, the wealthy retired banker and tourism developer Don Roberto Hernandez and his wife Claudia, who run the expensive Hacienda Mundo Mayas resorts in the Yucatan, Mexico, flew me to their planning retreat in the jungle and took me to stay at several of their fanciest resorts where they're experimenting with biological wastewater treatment and biodigesters and rainforest reclamation. They told our planning group, we prefer the terms thriving development and regenerative tourism. We don't want to sustain the status quo because the way things are and the way things are going are bad. We want to change, not sustain. We want the local Maya communities to thrive. We want the forest ecosystem and the coastal ecosystems to thrive. And this is why we're talking about thriving tourism and thriving development. We don't just want to survive, we want to thrive. Status quo sustainability, according to Weaver, is only warranted where a natural or bucolic rural setting is not stressed. In these cases, doing more of the same is possible to sustain. In other areas, the argument now revolves around enhancement dynamics. This follows the recommendations of the Brundtland Report and the very definition of sustainability as conceived then, that it would not affect future generations in a negative way. But what about making things actually better for future generations? Can tourism do that? Could tourism be used to guarantee it intragenerational as well as intergenerational equity? Weaver worries that intergenerational sustainability could be seen as, quote, an elitist principle that deliberately perpetuates societal and regional inequalities in the distribution of power and wealth. Even the desire to preserve wilderness untouched by human beings can be seen through this lens of inequality. At a time in history when 7.4 billion people are competing for land and resources, the very act of setting aside areas that most human beings are not allowed to touch is very controversial and can lead to tragic conflicts. When you add tourism into the mix, where some privileged people are now permitted to have access to those forbidden areas, particularly to get, engage in leisure activities, while the other 90% are forced to eke out a living in degraded habitats that have lost their ecosystem services, you have the seeds of war. The literature abounds with case studies where, for example, gorillas and elephants and other charismatic megafauna were exterminated and large trees deliberately cut or burned down as acts of protest in an effort to remove the attractions that draw tourists so the land could then be used by those living at the margins. These are extreme examples of what are called the indirect and induced impacts of tourism. Tourism systems have fuzzy boundaries. It's hard to say precisely what tourism is responsible for and what other factors are responsible for. Tourism is implicated in the world system and implicated in almost everything that happens. As soon as human beings and our current industrial and economic systems overlap with natural ecosystems and more traditional cultural systems, there will be an impact and we must carefully examine the role of indirect and induced impacts and the crucial influence played by external human and natural systems. Natural systems can also be a problem when they encounter other natural systems. It's not just people. The law of unintended consequences is always present, and even the accidental introduction by tourists and tourist operators of non-native species of animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, protozoans, and viruses have a huge and mostly unwanted impact. It's for this reason that customs agents in Australia, for example, swarm visitors with their sniffing dogs 
hovering around tourists arriving at their airports and forcing visitors to dispose of all food items. I once had a slice of frozen pizza taken away from me and was scolded. Unpredictable cause and effect relationships are yet another element of complexity that complicate the engagement with sustainable tourism. Page 21. Pages 21 through 24 of the book give more examples of the influence of external systems and the unintended and unpredictable cause and effect relationships. And the complexity illustrated, Weaver tells us, quote, warrants a holistic approach towards sustainability that entails indirect macro, intersectoral, and pan-realm assumptions about the scope of engagement with sustainable tourism. This is a holistic approach, which is contrasted by the confined approach which has a narrow business focus, only looks at direct impacts, and keeps a micro rather than macro perspective. The confined approach also confines itself to either environmental impacts or, or sociocultural impacts, but rarely both. Now, defenders of this narrow outlook claim that this minimalist sustainability with more restricted parameters of engagement is actually more realistic and is still appropriate primarily as a temporary framework that will eventually expedite entry into a broader sustainability arena. The comprehensive model, on the other hand, is more expensive and difficult to implement with its holistic pan-realm assumptions that focus on enhancement sustainability, intragenerational and intergenerational equity, indirect and induced impacts with an expanded space-time continuum. You see, expanding the space and time horizon when analyzing impacts requires sophisticated training and critics point out that both strong and weak sustainability approaches must always include financial sustainability, quote, without which the pursuit of environmental and sociocultural sustainability is irrelevant, end quote. The question for all of us involved in sustainable tourism is, how do we measure success? How do we know if we're on the road to intergenerational equity and sustainability, much less thriveability? For this, we must turn toward indicators. Now, indicator implementation is a major issue in sustainable tourism today. How to select appropriate indicators is, of course, a major field of study. Even after we've selected the indicators, how do we effectively measure and monitor them? Evaluation of indicators depends fundamentally on timing, on the identification of benchmarks and thresholds, and on proper indicator prioritization. But even when we get that right, Weaver points out, thresholds and benchmarks and priorities can often be, quote, arbitrarily manipulated for political or ideological purposes. For example, a manager might give priority to indicators that show less strain in the system or that are less expensive to redress. One way around this manipulation is to have governing bodies that have a more panoptic perspective make the decisions. That's the role that the World Tourism Organization, WTO, has played. WTO has played a lead role in creating 11 core indicators that, quote, would provide a basic framework for sustainable tourism management in any destination, end quote. These are shown in Table 2.1. They delineate specific measures for indicators like site protection, stress, use intensity, social impact, development control, waste management, planning process, critical ecosystems, consumer satisfaction, local satisfaction, and tourism contribution to the local economy. They also created supplementary indicators of sustainable tourism for selected environments, illustrated in Table 2.2. These suggested measures for, quote, levels of beach erosion and beach intensity, the extent of erosion caused by tourism in mountains, human population in wildlife parks and levels of poaching, air pollution measurements in urban environments, use intensity and restoration costs and disruptive behavior observed in cultural sites, changes in flora and fauna mixes and concentrations in unique ecological sites, social impacts in traditional communities, and measures of capital flight and freshwater availability in small islands. These indicators were very useful to mediate the debate about what exactly are we talking about when we use the nebulous concept of sustainable development as applied to tourism. With these indicators, finally, all stakeholders could come to the table with a clearer understanding of what we are trying to achieve. Subsequently, in 1996, a group of experts met in the Italian village of Bellagia and established general guidelines to inform the implementation of sustainable development strategies that included tourism. These so-called Bellagio principles are now one of the main sources of concepts supporting the specific indicators for the tourism industry, grounding them in an agreed-upon philosophical framework 
rationalized by the recognized non-viability of the do-nothing alternative. Having the principles has allowed progress to be made in a short period because now clear concepts exist upon which debates can focus. There's growth and support even though the indicators are imprecise and for those who reject most of them, since both the WTO indicators and the Bellagio were based on a, quote, clear preference for the comprehensive model and the holistic system-based approach with adequate spatial and temporal scopes taken into account, a recognition of the need for practicality makes a minimalist entry point available so that nobody has to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Bellagio principles encourage the following ten ideas. One, have a guiding vision and goals. Two, have a holistic perspective. Three, include essential elements such as equity, the ecological conditions upon which life depends, and non-market activities that contribute to well-being. Four, have an adequate scope. Five, have a practical focus. Six, maintain openness so that methods and data are accessible to all. Seven, engage in effective communication. Eight, encourage broad participation, especially key grassroots and otherwise voiceless groups. 9. Be iterative and adaptive and responsive to change through ongoing assessment. And 10. Build institutional capacity. Beneath, beneath each of these 10 headings are much more specific subheadings with key indicators. The case study at the end of the chapter shows how Scandinavia is successfully employing these sustainable tourism indicators and gives a set of 21 even more specific indicators that they use in the Network Evolution for Sustainable Tourism or NEST project and that even includes such things as the number of red-listed animal species, echo-labeled restaurants, bike paths and footpaths, and eco-friendly products sold. As these types of indicators evolve to be the norm, the industry begins to shape itself according to existing best practice models, and a feedback loop among tourism operators and tourists with better defined expectations begins to grow. Says Weaver, with its alluring premise of continued development that does not unduly harm a destination's natural and sociocultural environment, the idea of sustainable tourism has emerged as a priority objective of the global tourism sector since the mid-1990s. Let's hope that the number of tourist operations using these indicators and seeking their fulfillment grows faster than the damage the ever-expanding sector continues to cause. In subsequent chapters, we will explore even deeper ideas for how tourism can perhaps enhance rather than maintain the status quo so that both people and the places they love to visit can thrive.